Hello and welcome to my complete draft guide for the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. In this video, I'll be going over the 10 multicolor archetypes and the secret 11th archetype. I'll show you the best commons and rares in each color, discuss tips and combat tricks, we'll examine our mana fixing options and much more. Before we get started, if you're having trouble discerning the rarity of cards based on the set symbol, you can always check the bottom left corner of each card to figure it out. C stands for common, U for uncommon, and so on. Here's an overview of the multicolor archetypes, roughly sorted by their speed, and we'll start with blue-white on the slower end of the spectrum, and blue-white cares about artifacts and features the new craft mechanic. Craft appears on artifact cards, and in most cases we will be crafting with another artifact, although there are a few exceptions. Taking a look at the mural, it enters making a 4-4 token for 5 mana, and then we can pay 7 mana to craft with artifact as a sorcery, and then exile the mural alongside another artifact we control, or an artifact card in our graveyard, and then it will enter the battlefield transformed, making more 4-4 tokens for us. So these are all great if the game goes long. Cards like the Mischievous Pup are also great in this archetype, as it can maybe pick up one of our artifacts after it already provided a bit of value, so we can redeploy them, but it can also save some of our creatures from removal. Then a blue-black is another pretty slow archetype that wants to fill the graveyard to enable its Descend synergies. A card with Descend 8 requires us to have 8 or more permanent cards in our graveyard before the effect can take place, so that will take quite some time to achieve. Cards that help us mill additional cards into our graveyard, of course, will be great to make that happen. Then we continue our Descent theme in black-green, where we still want to fill the graveyard, but we might also be able to get cards back from our graveyard using the Scavenger. The Mycoid wants us to descend every turn by putting additional permanent cards into our graveyard. Now do keep in mind, tokens themselves don't enable Descent. While tokens are permanent, they aren't permanent cards, which is what we need to enable the Mycoid to keep making 1-1 Fungus tokens that cannot block. Those fungus tokens will also come in handy when playing black-white, which is a sacrifice deck, so we want lots of disposable creatures and other tokens we can sacrifice to some of our engines, such as Bartolome, the signpost uncommon for the archetype, or the Acolyte, for instance, and we can also sacrifice artifacts to these cards, so some of the artifact tokens in the set that aren't necessarily creatures are also fair game. Red-white is often a mid-range deck where you want to tap your own artifacts and creatures during your turn to enable certain synergies, such as on the Sunborn where we get to discover three. This is a new take on the Cascade mechanic, now it has a number assigned to it instead of being tied to the creature's mana value, and you're not forced to cast the card that you reveal, you can also decide to put it into your hand instead if it's a bit more conditional in nature. The Wonder Glyph is also happy to tap to enable those abilities, as we now get to discard a card and draw if we do. And the Infantry is also very helpful in this archetype, as we can tap it to enable those synergies, while still being a 2-4 back on defense. And Explorer is back once again, most pronounced in blue-green, where we've got quite a few additional payoffs for exploring. Most cards with Explore are already quite good and limited, and they can also help enable the various Descent synergies if we decide to put cards into the graveyard after revealing them. Red-green is all about dinosaurs, and it can certainly come out the gates pretty quickly with a good draw, but it can also play a longer game where you just want to cast some more expensive dinosaur cards and then leverage some of those dinosaur synergies. We are back to descending in black-red, but this time it's a bit more aggressively slanted than in our previous archetypes. A card like Deadweight is perfect for this archetype as a removal spell that also counts as a permanent card potentially going to the graveyard to enable those descent synergies. Then a green-white is an aggro deck that wants to enhance its creatures, whether it's with plus one plus one counters or other power and toughness boosts, and we also have a few payoffs, such as the exemplar drawing us extra cards if we manage to hit the opponent with a creature that has modified power. And finally, blue-red is an artifact aggro deck, so we get rewarded for generating treasure tokens or maybe the new map tokens, which are a way of letting our creatures explore, so that also has a bit of overlap with blue-green, of course. And then there's a small pirate sub-theme as well, so a few cards that reward you for controlling pirate creatures. 
Now I've already hinted at it earlier, but there is a secret 11th archetype, which is the cave deck. There's one uncommon payoff in every color, which means that the cave deck could take on lots of various forms, all the way from a two color deck to potentially a five color deck, if you've got enough mana fixing, just to try and fit in as many of these payoffs as possible. And the payoffs can be quite strong if you've got enough caves to support it. How do you get caves in limited? Well, there's a whole cycle of them at common, one in each color, and the these also have an activated ability for 5 mana that lets you discover 4, so these are just good to have in any 2 color deck, but particularly in the cave deck, having that cave subtype is incredibly helpful. And then there's a bunch more caves at common and uncommon, some of these only make colorless mana, but some of them can also enable descend, such as the promising vein, if you sacrifice it to get a basic land, counts as a permanent card going to the graveyard, so that can also enable some other synergies. And then there's also a few artifacts and enchantments that once transformed also turn into cave cards so those can also potentially increase your cave count to enable some of those other synergies. Now let's move on to the best commons in every color and in white I have Tinker's Tote at number one fits into pretty much every limited archetype. In blue-white we can sacrifice the tote to gain three and then exile it from our graveyard to craft with artifacts. In black-white we've got three things we can now sacrifice. In red-white we have three things we can tap to enable some of our synergies. And in green-white we've got two creatures that help us go wide so we can now enhance our team and get in for a lot of damage. Then the Cloud Guard is very similar, a 3-2 flyer making a token. Petrify a decent removal spell for 2 mana. Just be careful not to enchant an opposing artifact creature, since the opponent might craft with artifacts, and then basically still use the creature that you enchanted. And finally, the Glorifier of Suffering, especially at its best in a black-white sacrifice deck, or maybe a green-white beatdown deck, where you want to start out with a strong curve, 1-drop, 2-drop, play Glorifier, and then it can provide a lot of extra power and toughness. Then in blue we start with the Waterwind Scout, a 2-2 flyer that makes a map token when it enters, so it counts as an artifact that we can maybe craft with, can enable some of our synergies in the blue-red artifact aggro deck, and then can also explore, which is great in blue-green. So again, a great card in pretty much every archetype. Exploring can also put additional cards into the graveyard to enable our various descent synergies in blue-black. Then at the River Herald Scout, a 1-2 that explores when it enters, also very versatile. We've got a bounce spell with the Brackish blunder potentially making a map token and finally the oaken siren at its best in a blue white artifact deck but can also be quite nice in blue red artifact aggro and as a flyer can also wear equipment pretty well of which there are a few in the set then in black we start out with two solid removal spells and it's very close between the two. Join the Dead doesn't have a lot of synergy throughout the set but can deal with some larger creatures, whereas Deadweight is perfect for enabling Descent and is a lot cheaper to play in your more aggressive decks. Skullcap Snail, a 1-1 that makes the opponent exile a card from their hand, so it will not be enabling Descent for the opponent by exiling a card, but can enable Descent for you later if it ends up in the graveyard or you can maybe sacrifice it. And then the Screaming Phantom is a bit more narrow in scope, but is also perfect for enabling Descent turn after turn by attacking as a 2-2 flyer and milling a card. And Red also gets a few nice removal spells at common, with both a Braid and Rumbling Rock Slide getting a reprint, and Idol of the Deep King dealing 2 damage at instant speed thanks to Flash, and then we can transform it into an equipment that we can attach to one of our creatures right away. Plundering Pirate making a treasure token, also great at enabling various synergies, including a craft with artifact, such as on the Idol of the Deep King. And then a green also gets a nice removal spell with the final strike. Poison Dart Frog ramps and fixes our colors while holding off large flyers by gaining Death Touch. Pathfinding Angst Jaw helps us explore, counts as a dinosaur, so it also fits into a lot of different archetypes. And then the Mineshaft Spider also has decent stats as a 3-4 with reach that mills two cards when it enters, so great at enabling a descend. Now there's going to be quite the jump in power level when discussing the gods of the set. Luckily these are all mythic rare, so you should not encounter them very often, but these are all incredibly powerful. Creatures that even when destroyed transform into a land, which can then later transform back into the creature if a certain condition is met. So these are very annoying to deal with. Luckily there are a few more permanent answers at common and uncommon. Eaten by Pranas can turn the god into a 1-1 creature that loses all abilities, and then a Ray of Ruin, Dusk Rose Reliquary and Quicksand Whirlpool can all exile the god so it doesn't transform into a land. Now you could also try to counter the gods, but counter spells do get a bit worse in this set than they would be otherwise. 
Part of the reason is the existence of the craft mechanic. Players can quickly deploy the craft artifacts and then later transform them, and that's not something you can counter. And then there's also just fewer instants in general in the set because of the descent mechanic wanting there to be lots of permanent cards, so it's less likely that you have another instant you can play alongside your counterspell if the opponent doesn't force you to cast a counterspell in the first place, so that leads to a lot of wasted mana. Now we can talk about the best rares in the set, outside of the gods we've already discussed. In white there's the reprint of Resplendent Angel. Once you activate it you can start making angel tokens pretty easily and make it impossible for the opponent to race. Thousand Moons Smithy makes a large token that grows with the number of artifacts and creatures you control, and then can also transform to generate even more of those tokens. And then Unstable Glyph Bridge is kind of a pseudo sweeper that can also transform into a powerful flyer that makes it hard for the opponent to do much of anything. Then in blue the power level drops a bit compared to the other colors, but there's still some very nice rares available. First Among Equals can provide card advantage when artifacts enter. The Larcenist is essentially a removal spell as long as it sticks around as a 2-3 flyer with Ward 1. And then at the Alluring Scoundrel a 2-1 with Flash and Flying, that when it hits the opponent can also give us additional card selection. And then in black there's the Blood Letter, which will double our damage output. Now it is triple black to cast, so it won't always be easy to play it on curve, but still very powerful. Then the Bringer of the Last Gift, a 6-6 flyer for 8 mana that will reverse whatever's in play with whatever's in the graveyard, so that can also take over if we can set up our graveyard carefully. And then a Preacher of the Schism can be a nice 2-4 with Death Touch that provides value whenever it attacks, whether it's making 1-1 lifelinking tokens or drawing cards at the cost of 1 life. A bone Horde to Dracosaur is among the more ridiculous bombs in the set, and certainly competes with its god counterpart. Breaches is also incredibly powerful if you can play it on curve, at its best in Blue Red Pirates, but it's going to be amazing in pretty much any red deck. And then the Trumpeting Acarnosaur has the flexibility of dealing 3 damage early on, but we prefer to cast it so we can discover 5 in addition to putting a 7-6 Trampler into play. Then Hwatli may have lost her spark, but she still definitely packs a punch. Finding a basic land when she enters already provides a nice bit of value, and then especially once transformed into the Saga, can slowly take over, making a pair of dinosaur tokens, and then especially if we have a large dinosaur to search up with Chapter 3, we can set up lethal on Chapter 4 once we give our dinosaurs a double strike and trample. Then the Skullspore Nexus gets a discount similar to the Great Henge, can activate to double a creature's power until end of turn, and leaves behind large tokens tokens when our non-token creatures die, and then the hulking raptor, a nice 4-mana dinosaur that helps us ramp. And then a few of the multicolor bombs include the only planeswalker in the set, Quintorius, especially nice in the red-white discover decks. Then we've got the Deep Fathom Echo letting us explore every turn, and then the Hatcher puts a lot of power and toughness into play once we transform both of the dinosaur eggs. And then in the artifact section, there's the threefold Thunderhulk, which can make a bunch of tokens. We can use those tokens to add extra counters to the Thunderhulk, which in turn will make even more tokens. So that's kind of a snowballing effect. And then the inner sun will help us discover turn after turn, so that can also take over on a stalled board. Now, if you don't want to be caught off guard, it's also worth taking a look at all the instant speed plays that are available in the set. So if the opponent passes the turn with a bunch of mana untapped, you can start to narrow down what they could possibly have. In white, there's a few combat tricks, there's a few removal spells, mostly relying on creatures being tapped or attacking, so they're definitely better in a more defensive deck. Then in blue, there's the counter spells that we've already brought up, there's a couple bounce effects, and then a few creatures with flash that could try and set up an ambush, but these are mostly at higher rarities. Then in black, we've got a few instant speed removal spells, a way to sacrifice a creature or artifact could also be relevant, and then a fungal fortitude I want to highlight as an effect we've seen in the past, but this time it's attached to an enchantment aura that gives a permanent plus 2 plus 0 bonus, and in this set in particular, it also counts as a permanent card for descent purposes, so I actually think Fortitude is going to be pretty solid. Then Red has two decent tricks and a few more instant speed removal spells, most of which we've already covered. And then a Green has a few pump effects, Hwatli's Final Strike could also lead to some blowouts, and the Malamet's Scythe is also worth playing around, giving a creature a permanent plus 2 plus 2 bonus in the form of an equipment. And then there's a 6 mana Runaway Boulder dealing 6 damage when it enters. And here's a more condensed list of all the tricks, and then I'll make it more printer-friendly in case you want it in paper. 
Then besides all the instant speed tricks, it's also good to know about all the sweepers in the set so you don't end up overextending into them. In black there's the Malicious Eclipse giving creatures minus two minus two until end of turn. The Terror Tide will require enough permanent cards in Graveyard to enable it. And then we've already covered the Bringer and the Glyph Bridge. And then red has Tectonic Hazard dealing one damage to each creature and the Calamitous Cave-In which will appear in the more dedicated cave decks. And now let's take a look at our mana fixing options, especially for those multicolor cave decks which will need it. In green there's a Lore Keeper which only works with dinosaurs, whereas the Frog and Paleontologist can make a man of any color for any purpose. And then a Cosmium Confluence especially can be a very nice payoff for the cave deck. So if you see this early it could be a sign that you should try the Archetype, as it can find three different caves or grow your caves into creatures, can also destroy enchantments. And then the Sunbird Standard makes a man of any color, can also craft it into a creature. The Captivating Cave and Forgotten Monument alongside more caves can also fix our colors. And Compass Gnome and the Surveyor can go get a land, Gnome puts it on top where a Surveyor puts it straight into play and can also get any of our caves, so that can also be good value. And then we can also fall back on the Treasures to fix our colors. Buried Treasure may be not the most exciting card, but the Minecart and Pickaxe can provide a steady supply of Treasure Tokens, especially good in the Blue-Red archetype. And then Plundering Parrot, also a great 3-drop that can fix our colors. And then we also can't forget about the basic land cyclers. There's one in each color and they cycle for two mana to get the respective basic land. This also helps enable descent at instant speed which can be very relevant and they're also just good flood insurance since casting these as six or seven mana creatures is also totally fine. Then a few nice card interactions at lower rarity include Defossilize alongside the aforementioned cycling creatures as we can cycle them early and then at 5 mana Defossilize to bring them back into play and double explore. Especially nice if we can bring back one of the 7 mana dinosaurs with Defossilize. And then a Sunfire Torch plays well with Death Touch creatures because it's the creature itself dealing damage when we sacrifice the torch. So if it's Death Touch damage it can take out any creature the opponent controls no matter how large it is. And then another interaction to keep in mind is Descend creatures and then Instance or other cycling cards that can put cards into the graveyard at instant speed to maybe grow those creatures such as the Cave Worm getting two additional power. So always be on the lookout for open mana if the opponent attacks or tries to block with the Cave Worm. Now if you're drafting a sacrifice deck or a craft deck you might be on the lookout for some cheap enablers and this section has you covered. Market Gnome is perfect in both sacrifice and craft decks as it will replace itself. The Clayfire Bricks already got you a planes and two life so we don't mind sacrificing it or exiling it. And the same is true for Tinker's Toad, especially if we can craft it out of the graveyard after gaining three. And then in blue there's the Inverted Iceberg which already drew us a card so we don't have to craft for six mana, can always just sacrifice it to another effect. And then in black there's the greedy freebooter at one mana letting us scry one and make a treasure when it dies. And then the mephitic draft can also draw a card at the cost of one life when it enters and when it's put into the graveyard. So we actively want to sacrifice it. And then the skullcap snail already made the opponent exile a card from their hand so it's also a good creature to potentially sacrifice. And then of course always be on the lookout for various tokens that we can sacrifice to some of our effects such as map tokens, treasure tokens and the 1-1 gnome tokens. Now if you've drafted the original Ixalan, you might have a preconceived notion that certain creature types are important, but when it comes to merfolk and vampires that's no longer true in this set. Merfolk have the pilgrimage as a payoff, whereas vampires have the paladin. So there's no reason to limit yourself to only picking vampires if you're drafting black-white, or only picking merfolk if you're blue-green, since the payoffs simply aren't there. And then a Roaming Throne also has a bit of overlapping synergy, although you're often better off naming Human as opposed to one of those four major creature types. Now Pirates actually have some payoffs at lower rarity, so those are potentially worth building around, but especially Dinosaurs have the highest density of payoffs, and as you'll see here there's quite a few between red and green and some multicolor cards topping off with Gishoth as a nice reprint. Another point worth making is that there's more playable one mana creatures in the set at lower rarity than there have been in quite some time. In white we've got the gnome, guidewing and bat which are all great. Then blue's got the wrestler and especially the siren is exciting. 
Black has a Freebooter, Red has the Tomb Raider, and then Green has the Scout, the Lore Keeper for Dinosaurs, and then the Seeker could also be playable in a more dedicated Explore deck, although not quite as exciting as the Scout. This doesn't necessarily mean that the format is going to be super aggressive, but it does mean that you want to keep an eye on your curve to make sure to include a few one-drops if possible. Then it's also worth noting that creature lands are back, and these are always great to have in Limited if you're playing those respective colors, since they give you another nice mana sink alongside maybe the common caves that let you discover. And then I also wanted to highlight some one-off returning mechanics. There's Kellen as the only adventure creature, the Evangelist with Battle Cry, we've got the Blue God with the rebound mechanic, letting us replay Instance and Sorceries one more time, and then the Tortoise rewards us for having high toughness, but overall not a very heavily supported theme. So yeah, that concludes my draft guide for Lost Caverns of Ixalan. If you want to see me rate every individual card in the set, that spreadsheet is available right now to all my supporters on Patreon, so make sure to check that out. And then you'll also be able to join the private Discord server, where you can discuss strategy with like-minded individuals. If you have any comments or feedback on this new style of set review, make sure to leave them down below. But for now, I want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day.